James Declan, and then we're going to go into the importance of music um, with my friend Joanne Gilmore Jackson, who is a um, award-winning gospel singer. And so you are all for uh, in for a really uh, great treat. And um, and then we'll just go on from there. But um, we might ask you to participate a little bit too. Just warning you now. All right. So and then and and I must also say is that. 
when you don't participate, we we really kind of call out those people a little bit more. <laughs> so, just to let you know. So this was a monologue that I did um, some years ago for the Ghost Walk in Pueblo, and um, it was on James Beckworth. And so I'm going to do that for you. Do I look like a liar to you? Don't answer that. <laughs> well, that's exactly what people have called me for years, a liar. Me, James Beckworth, the legendary mountain man, crow wind and chief, explorer, guide, and trapper. I guess people used to have a hard time stomaching that a black man like myself could truly be all those things. But I'm the real deal. I, I published my autobiography during my lifetime. The life and adventures of James B. Beckworth. Pretty much everything I wrote has been proven to be true. Uh, of course, um, there might have been um, a, few, a few slightly exaggerated <laughs> mountain man um, tales. Uh, but for a mountain man, the only sin is the sin of being dull. <laughs> And that I never was. I was born about 1800 in Virginia to Sir Jennings Beckworth and one of his slaves. My father was a fair man. Not only did he educate me like a legitimate son, but he also went to court three times to acknowledge my deed of emancipation for me. He wanted to make sure that his son was a free man. But I had a restless spirit and I longed for adventure. I was learning the trade of a blacksmith and found that work to be monotonous. So adventure call. I had a strong desire to see the celebrated Rocky Mountains and the great Western wilderness that so many people were talking about. I was a wrangler for his expedition to explore these mountains. The Indians soon became friendly to me, and I was indebted to them, for showing me their choicest hunting grounds. Uh, there were days you'd hear stories of pioneers and people settling on the Old West, <laughs> but I smile in comparison to their sufferings with what myself and the other mountain men endured, the forts that afforded them protection where these travelers were built by ourselves. At the constant peril of our lives, without wives or children to comfort us along our lonely way, without well-furnished wagons to resort to when hungry, no roads before us but trails, our clothing consisting of skins and of animals, often whole days of insufficient rations, entirely without food. These are sufferings which make their accounts seem trivial in comparison. Now, during this time, a story began to circulate in the West that I was actually the long lost son of a Crow Indian chief. At, at the story went, that I had been abducted by the Cheyennes and sold to the whites, where I had been raised ever since. Well, one day when I was setting traps, I plundered into an Indian horse herd and immediately was captured by their guards. While I was being marched into the village, <sighs> Virgil watching from afar saw clearly that he couldn't help me and went back to the encampment to tell the tale of my certain death. Well, while my friends were lamenting my untimely fall, I was being hugged and kissed to death by a whole large of near and dear crow relatives. Even if I should have denied my crow origin, they wouldn't believe me. How could I dash the joy? <laughs> I went on to 
distinguished myself as a warrior and won the rank of the Crow War Chief. I married um, eight wives during my lifetime with the Crow and perfected one of the most valuable skills, stealing horses. Now, I suppose you've been wondering, this man is fascinating, but where do we come in? What does this fine fellow have to do with Pueblo? Well, my friends, the Santa Fe Trail, I was traveling for a bit. I ended up in Taos and shuckled myself to another woman, Louisa Sandoval. I took my wife and we reached the Arkansas in 1842, where I erected a trading post. In a very short time, I was joined by 15, 20 trappers and their families. Soon we had grown to a little settlement and we gave it the name Pueblo. I recognized the beauty of its situation here next to the Arkansas. Now, I would leave periodically on business and upon returning home one time, I found that home was not quite the home it had been. My wife had married another man. <laughs> and when she realized her mistake, of course, she offered herself back again. But I declined, preferring to enjoy once more the sweet blessings of single blessedness. <laughs> I was a wanderer, always searching for the next opportunity and adventure. You know, I was a guide for one of the first groups who used my paths the, in California called the James Beckworth Pass. And a little girl described it like this. Ours was the first, oh, no, I'll do it. <laughs> Ours was the first of the covered wagons to break the trail through the Beckwood Pass to, into California. We were guided by the famous scout, Jim Beckworth, who was a historical figure. And to my mind, one of the most beautiful creatures that ever lived. I, I'm just reading what she wrote here. <laughs> I guess I made it quite an impression on that little girl. And I hope that I've made an impression with all of you on this fascinating, adventurous story of a man. He was a character. It's kind of fun just to hear. I, I, I would have loved that new kind of person. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, what an interesting life. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Ms. Joanne Gilmore Jackson, who you will see later on. Well, I was reading at that. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> You'll see what I mean later. Uh, push the square button. There it is. It's on. I was going to do it. Oh. Even it talks to me. <laughs> the problem isn't that it talks to you, it's that you don't listen. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs>
You know, their music was so important to um, the African people. A spiritual is a type of religious folk song that is closely associated with the enslavement of the African people in the in American South. The songs proliferated in the last few decades of the 18th century, leading up to the abolishment and legalization of legalized uh, slavery in the 1860s. The African-American spiritual, also called the Negro spiritual, constitutes as one of the largest and most significant forms of the American folk song. One of the things that happened was during slavery that carried on to the Buffalo soldiers is music was a way of communicating. And they did that a lot with what was called call and response songs. So let's do a call and response song so that way they can get an idea. Um, let's do. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let nobody. Turn me round, keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching out the things I say. Ain't gonna let nobody tell me wrong, tell me. 
You bring her up here. Well, she Leslie, come on. Now, I'm not young. 
I mean, you're not gonna believe this, but I am 69 years old. And I have to put up with this young boy here that don't know how to act and try my patience. He's so bad, young. Well, he's 60. He's 60 years old, but you know what? Kennedy is the sweetest thing I know. So you will be third. You will bring up the rear. So you, you go back there so you know when to come in with row row. This section here is going to be first, and the middle is going to be second, okay. and you will be third. And try to first, second, third. Okay? All right. I'm going to sing with the first, and then I want my friend there to sing with the second to bring them in. You want a microphone on you? Let's talk about that. Yeah, that was wireless. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. One, two, three. Okay. Oh. <laughs> and it's not going to go to back there. No, no, no. Okay. I'm like you folks. All right. Ready? One, two, three. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Now, second group in the wind. Let's do the second group. Now let's do you. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. And Kennedy? Oh, this we got. We're not gonna hold our breath. Go ahead. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Okay, point, point, we're going to start because we don't finish the whole sentence before the next uh, group come in, okay? okay? So it goes like, row, row, row your boat, gently down the stream, row, merrily, 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 row, right is far and scaling, merrily, row, the sun is letting go, gently down the stream, row, merrily, down the stream, sing for you a song called Hold On. A song called Hold On. No one, oh, can someone take that out? No one, no one let me come in to all that sand windows there. Actually, you know what? You know what? You know what? I really want you to do? I want you to go. Stop. Stop. Don't speak it up. No one, 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 no one,
coming in to talk a little bit about um, Buffalo Soldiers, and he's a great guy that has done some great things with um, spreading that history throughout Colorado and, and beyond, and uh, but we'll let uh, Joanne finish off our segment for tonight. Thank you all for letting us be here. Try this out loud because it works better, I think. Can you imagine growing up in the 50s and 60s? And by the way, Joanne, I'm 69 too, by the way. But growing up and not knowing your history, not knowing anything about your history, and not understanding what it was that we did as a people in the United States. And that's the way our history was. I didn't learn about Buffalo soldiers 
until I went to a Buffalo Soldier Post when I was in, after I graduated from college and was commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Army. I had never heard what a Buffalo Soldier was. I'd never, never been introduced to them. Didn't know that Fort Huachuca, where I was stationed, was a Buffalo Soldier post and was a segregated post and had two officers clubs and the Negro officers couldn't visit the white officers club. And I thought, my goodness, what is up with this? But the first day that I got there in Fort Huachuca, the duty officer says to me, he says, Ray, he says, uh, we don't have anything for you. It's Sunday, but Monday morning you go to work, okay? Uh, they said, hey, you know what? You ought to check out Sierra Vista, drive around the post a little bit, get to see, get to be a little bit more familiar with what's going on there. Oh, by the way, there's a museum right across the parade field from where we're at right now. He says, you should go down and look at that. And I walked in the door, and what I was greeted with was a bunch of pictures of African-American men in military uniform. And I said, who the heck are those guys? <laughs> who the heck are these guys? And so I personally started doing research on my own to try to understand who the Buffalo Soldiers were. So when I start doing these presentations, and I didn't start doing the presentations until probably uh, the early 2000s, but when I started doing these presentations, I thought it was important that people just understand who the Buffalo Soldiers are and show the uniform and talk about stories about these guys and what they did during their, their time in the military. But then I started learning that there were more guys and one of the first things that I did was Miss Lucille Corsentino says, says to me in 2014, Ray, I think there's Buffalo soldiers buried at, at Roselawn Cemetery. And I said, whoa, this is so cool. And so I went to Roselawn Cemetery and looking for these Buffalo soldiers, and I didn't find them. What I found opened another door. And that door was these were civil war veterans. These were African Americans that were in the Civil War that are buried at Roselawn Cemetery. So, I mean, that just like, wow, you always wondered, what the heck did the black people do during the Civil War? Did we just wait and see who was going to win? Or did we participate? Well, my story talks about the participation of those men. And while I was doing that, some gentleman, while I was doing a presentation, says to me, well, what about the Revolutionary War? Hey, have you thought about the French and Indian War? And I said, what are you talking about? He says, did you not know that the African American has been involved in every armed conflict that the United States has been involved with since the beginning of time? I said, what? How is this possible that nobody talks about this? How is it possible? But there is some paintings of those wars. Well, yeah, yeah, just kind of indiscreet, you know, they're kind of off to the side sometimes. Uh, in, when you talk about the Revolutionary War, or, or actually, yeah, the Revolutionary War, um, as George Washington is going across the Potomac, there's a black man sitting there next to him. All right? So, yeah, they're, they're there, but a lot of times you don't know, and you don't know what you've never been told. And so when I started doing these presentations, I talked about the Buffalo Soldiers. And I got all these nice stares from three uh, third graders. And these third graders kind of looked at me like, yeah, black guys are in the Army. Cool. I don't know what's important about the Buffalo Soldiers, but black guys are in the Army. I understand that. And I said, maybe I'm not getting it. So then I said, well, how about if I go back in time and I tell you a little bit about slavery and then I go into the Civil War and then I start talking about the Buffalo Soldiers. And what about the Tuskegee Airmen? You know? So all of these stories, here's, here's something that I, I found to be totally amazing to me. I grew up in Colorado Springs in a church 
of Payne Chapel AME Church. There were three Colorado-based Buckle or Tuskegee Airmen that were in our congregation. And I never understood what a Tuskegee Airman was. I never understood the struggles that those men went through to, to get to where we are today. So when I give my presentations, I don't just give a history of this group of men who were Buffalo soldiers. I want to try to give you guys some education. I always like to ask this question, and some of you guys have heard this question before. When were the first African Americans allowed entry in the West Point Military Academy? Well, what, 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 40s? 1940s? Anybody else? 1970. 1970? 1870. Five years after the end of the Civil War, the first two African Americans from southern states earned entry into West Point Military Academy. One guy dropped almost immediately. The other guy spent four years. He spent four years, and in his fourth year, he was found tied to his bed. His ears were slashed. His hair was cut. And they wanted to court-martial him for self-inflicting wounds. This man was so eloquent in his writings. It was absolutely amazing. When was the first African-American who graduates from West Point? Henry Flipper, 1877. First of 20 African Americans that were allowed entry in the West Point Military Academy. And when you think about that, you say, wow, what did this guy have to endure? No one would talk to him. No one would eat with him. No one would sleep in the same room with him. The only time anyone addressed him was when they gave him a military order. How about that as a life for four years? Yet he graduates from West Point, gets commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Cavalry. He comes out west. He fights against Victorio, the Apache chief. He bears, bears messages between Grierson, Colonel Grierson, and, and the uh, troops out in the field. There's so many stories. It's absolutely amazing what we don't know. And if you can imagine being from a community where you don't know anything about your history and how it relates to United States military history. And that's what I talk about when I do my presentations, United States military history. How many people have been to White Front Aircraft Museum? How many people have seen the the United States military history display with all the black faces on the wall. Right, right by the B-29 bomber. Okay? That's my display. And it's basically mimicking the display that I saw at Fort Huachuca, except for I start with the French and Indian War, and I go to Vietnam. And I talk about segregation. A lot of people don't realize that. The United States military was segregated from the beginning of time all the way through the end of the Korean War. The black units that were there were treated less than fairly. It's tough when you're fighting a battle against the enemy and then find out that you're, you have more of a battle with, with people that are on your side. And that's what these guys dealt with. There's a story. Everybody thinks the Tuskegee Airmen were the first African American flyers, right? Not true. There's a gentleman who was from Georgia. He goes to the to, to Europe in World War uh, before World War One. He joins the French Army. Ultimately, they say, by God, you're, good. you're a good fireman. You can shoot. You can shoot exceptionally well. We're going to put you in an airplane. So they make him a gunner in an aircraft. 
And then they say, you know what? You're pretty good. We're going to make you a pilot. And they make him a pilot. This man fights the entire World War I battles. He fights it all. When the Americans enter the war, he goes to the Americans and says, I'm an American citizen. I'd like to be a, a pilot for you guys. And they say, absolutely not. We don't accept blacks in our units. Army aviation won't accept you. Okay? Those kinds of stories are there. Talk about World War II. Oh, heck, don't even do that yet. World War I. Buffalo soldiers? How many Buffalo soldiers go to fight World War I? Anybody know? The answer is zero. They don't let them go. They don't let them go. There is such a concern in the United States during the World War I time frame that they are afraid that if they give these black men weapons and they send them to fight in Europe, they're not sure where they're going to where they're going to fire those rounds. So they don't want them to have guns. So they train an entirely new African American force, and they send those guys to fight World War One. Now they call themselves Buffalo Soldiers, but they're not. They're absolutely not Buffalo Soldiers. But they used the name because the name meant something to those men. Okay? Wouldn't yes, sir. 40 years later, though? I mean, those guys didn't spell the old. What time were these Buffalo Soldiers? Oh, Buffalo Soldiers? Uh, so the Buffalo Soldier Organization basically, basically, at the end of the Civil War, the United States government said, we're going to do we're going to do a couple of things. The Negro did an exceptionally good job fighting in the Civil War. So we are going to create an all-encompassing military. And they said, as soon as you recruiters go out there and recruit these black guys, we're going to incorporate them into your units. There wasn't one that was recruited. They didn't want them in the military. So the government says, hey, no problem. We'll just make them as segregated units. So they created two cavalry regiments, the 9th and the 10th U.S. Cavalry. They created four infantry regiments, the 38th, 39th, 40th, and 41st infantry. All of them about 1,000 in strong. Okay? They never filled all of those ranks in the, in the infantry side, but they did fill the uh, 9th and 10th U.S. Cavalry. Here's a nice story for you. George Armstrong Custer, everybody remember him? Great name, right? That guy was offered to keep his Brigadier General status if he would take command of the 8th of, or the 9th of the 10th U.S. Cavalry, the Black Cavalry. And he said, absolutely not. That would destroy my military career and I will not do it. And they said, well, fine. If you won't take the command of a Black unit, and you can be a lieutenant colonel again, your regular army rank, and you can have the choice of whichever regiment you want. By God, I want the second. Okay? Now, the African Americans were there when George Armstrong Custer got handed his lunch, and they were saying, dodge that one. <laughs> right? They were there. But they were another one of those units that was kind of told, go off this way, when George went off the other way to attack the, uh, the Native Americans. And then he lost the plot. Okay? Uh, so anyway, <laughs> there are so many stories. And I, I, I would love to spend lots and lots of time with you guys to tell you all of the stories that I know. Uh, I was going into World War I. World War I, not one. Buffalo soldier, including the officers, were not allowed to go and fight the war. Uh, there was a gentleman uh, by the name of Charles Young. Charles Young was the third African American to graduate from West Point. He graduated in 1889, went through the ranks, became a colonel, 
in the United States Army. He would have been promoted to a Brigadier General status in World War I, except for the government said, absolutely not. We cannot allow a black man to command white soldiers. Okay? Let that sink in. We cannot. They medically discharge this man and don't allow, allow him back in the military until after the World War I. So Okay. There's another man, Benjamin Oliver Davis Sr. How many people know Benjamin Oliver Davis Sr.? You're not raising your hand. He spends 50 years in the United States military. He goes from the rank of a private to a sergeant first class. He goes into officer candidate school. He becomes a lieutenant. He goes through the ranks. They send him to the Philippines during World War I. And he stays in the Philippines as a supply officer. All right? World War II, just before World War II, they promote him to Brigadier General. He's the first African American general officer in the military. Humble beginnings, guys. At the turn of the century, there were three African American officers in the military. Three. So, <laughs> 1900, okay, in 1900, there were only three black officers in the military. Charles Young, Benjamin Oliver Davis Sr., and this other gentleman, John Ernest Green. Now, you want to know what's pretty fascinating about John Ernest Green? He's my great uncle. Wow. And I didn't find out about him until... Five years ago. I didn't even know he was in the military. He spends 29 years in the military. He's a lieutenant colonel by the time he decides to retire. But he's in Haiti during World War I. Okay. World War II is another one of those disasters. The military has made a decision that they are going to do everything in their power to ensure the African American gets no recognition and they keep the African Americans in service support organizations until the Tuskegee Air uh, the Tuskegee experiment forced by Eleanor Roosevelt uh, until that actually gets kicked off they have no intentions of allowing a, an African American to fly a military aircraft okay mm -hmm. How did Eleanor Roosevelt intervene to have that done? She went to the training program and said, I want to fly with one of these colored soldiers. And yeah, she went to Tuskegee, Alabama, and demanded that one of those one of those gentlemen fly her. And then she insisted that why are you keeping them here? Why aren't they why aren't they being involved? And you know, if you've seen the movie Red Tails. Am I getting more? <laughs> I think we all are getting more. You guys are too warm. <laughs> yeah. So the military does a lot of things. A couple of other things the military did. There was a pink battalion that was created at the beginning of the war. It was an African American segregated pink battalion. 761st Pink Battalion. They don't get engaged in the, in the war until D-Day is finished. And then George Patton makes the decision, I don't believe that these guys are going to be good tankers. I don't think that they're going to be able to hang in there. I think that they'll flee when they're fired upon. I don't think that they can hit a target. He brings them from the United States. They've been training for almost two years before they get engaged. And then Patton makes the, the other very, very important decision. He puts them at the head of his army as they leave France and go into Belgium and Holland and across Germany into Switzerland. They are the lead element of the Patton army. Okay? Nobody has ever heard of them. They're called the Black Panthers. 
They were the original Black Panthers. Uh, 761st Tank Battalion. There's another unit in World War II. World War II, they train a battalion of paratroopers, African American paratroopers. They never leave the United States during the entire war. They don't leave the United States because they can't find a commander willing to allow them to become a part of their unit. So the government says, well, we'll just make them fire jumpers. So they become the first pair of jumpers that jumped into fight, fight forest fires during World War II. So when the Japanese were sending their Fugo bombs across the ocean and they would start fires, these guys would go in and put out those fires and then regroup into the next one. So we, we can, I mean, there are so many of those kinds of stories. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, the Lido Road, how many people know about the Lido Road? The Japanese destroyed the Lido Road going from uh, Burma to China. And it's a supply route that the United States military wants to use. It gets destroyed. And so the United States government decides they're going to rebuild it. 80% of the engineers building that Lido Road are African American. 60% of the African American, 60% of the engineers on the Alaskan Highway. <coughs> during the war are African American. The Red Ball Express, everybody remember the movie about the Red Ball Express? Oh, you guys aren't old enough. <laughs> they, they, they showed the Red Ball Express, 80% of the drivers supplying all of the stuff to keep Patton's army moving across Europe, the ammunition, the fuel, the uh, food, the water, all of that continuously moving, 80% of the drivers on the Red Ball Express or African American. You never see them in the movie, though. So there, there are so many, there are countless stories of, of basic abuse of the African American and segregation of the African American. By the way, here, here's a cool one. People will love this one. In the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Civil War, the Navy in the United States was integrated. They didn't care if you could fire a gun, by God, you were a gun. Okay? They didn't care if you're black or white or whatever. After the Civil War, the Navy did everything they possibly could to eliminate all of the African Americans from the naval force. And that didn't change until World War II. In World War II, the Navy said, we're going to do something different, guys. We're going to create two ships of African Americans, commanded by white officers, and we're gonna we're gonna test them to see if they can do a, a decent job. So they created two. One was a sub chaser, and you know that was the Navy's idea of how we were gonna handle the segregation issue. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you're saying that prior to the Civil War, the U.S. Navy was integrated. But after it, they segregated it. What what was their justification? What what did they say? Jim Crow, baby. We don't care. So that was into the seventies and eighties. Yeah. They they were they were segregated from eighteen sixty six going forward. They went from I think they had about thirty percent of their naval uh, manpower was was African American. They went down to less than less than a uh, percent. They almost completely eliminated. The Marine Corps, our Marine Corps, their answer to segregation was we just won't have any blacks. There were no blacks in, in, in the Marine Corps. Not until Korea. Okay? And that's the, that's the stuff I think is important for people to hear. I, you know, we can t I could tell you all kinds of stories about these guys riding, you know, going to places where nobody else wanted to go. But honestly, let's learn about history. And I spent a lot of time trying to research and understand history and make some sense of it. And those are just a few of the examples. How about another one, World War II-wise? 
Did you guys know that the United States government decided that they were going to create bombing crews that were African American? They flew the, the P, oh no, they threw, flew the uh, B 25 bombers. Never left the United States. Not the entire war. Never left the United States. You know, and yet repeatedly they proved themselves in battle. Yeah. They had the battle of town in uh, Richmond in the Civil War where they put the two units of black infantry out front and and with their help, they went through 12 batteries mm -hmm. and overtook 12 batteries. Yeah. I mean, it turned, it turned that battle. Yep, you're absolutely right. Yes, How close uh, true was the movie Glory? It was a good movie. Matter of fact, that's how I got introduced to the fact that there were blacks in the, in the Civil War. Glory! And then they only talked about the one unit, right? There were 186 regiments of African Americans that fought during the Civil War on the Union side. <laughs> on the Union side. Okay. And Robert Smalls. And Robert Smalls, absolutely. And he became a commander. He, and he commanded the power. Yeah. So there are great stories. And you can find those great little stories. But then you wonder well, what did the other four million blacks do during the Civil War. So, so Ray, what were these guys? These guys? They, they were probably uh veterans of the of the Civil War. Talk about what they did out of Fort Huachuca. Oh. Because that's really important. All right. Well, I'm not sure I can tell you what they did at Fort Huachuca. <laughs> the African Americans, they they ran the, the uh, Pony Express. They built forts. They built roads. Um, I went down to Fort Garland, by the way. This is kind of a side note. I went to Fort Garland. And they got this beautiful barracks that they set up for the African Americans. And I said, wait a minute. They never let the black guys live in those barracks. They built them and then they had to leave because the white guys were going to come in and take over those barracks. They never got to use the barracks. They were out in the field. They were running patrols. They were not sitting inside of the fort, guarding the forts. They built them and then they were kicked out. Go for the fort. Well, I'm just going to say, I don't remember where, but somewhere they went down to Texas and they were building stuff and everything was going great. And then they got into a scuffle with the local whites and, and they slaughtered them. And then and then they were court martialed and, and several of the black men were hung when they hadn't been the ones that started the fight in the first place. So what, she talking, what she's talking about is there were, there were actually two incidences in, in Texas. One was in Brownsville. Um, where there was a scuffle over a white woman, and uh, they said that this young black man was taking advantage of her, and they didn't like that idea. And so, next thing you know, rifles are brought out, and this is just before they they were thinking about sending these black guys off to go to France to fight in World War One, and they said absolutely not. The other one was in Houston, and there were 23 African Americans that were court-martialed and uh, they were killed. Okay, and that was the end of we're not sending these guys uh, to to fight in World War One. Uh, give you another example: the nurses. They trained 1,200 African American nurses to go help out during World War One. The government made a decision: we're not going to bring any of those black nurses. Into the into the fold. As a matter of fact, only 13 of these women were brought in after the end of this, the, the first war, and then they were there just to treat the flu uh, epidemic patients. So that's all that they were there. For. Yes, ma'am. Didn't the Buffalo Soldiers uh, help guard the national park? They did. Uh, one of the one of those things that Charles Young did. Uh, his 10th Cavalry, uh, they were they were guarding uh, Yosemite, uh, and and they 
They were actually building more roads. They built more roads in a year than all of the other units uh, combined. Uh, so they did an outstanding job. Uh, there are just so many, so many stories. So very, very many positive stories. Uh, yes, sir. I heard a story that the Buffalo soldiers had a role to play in the Indian, Indian massacre. Yeah, they were there. They, they didn't have a role. They were they were another one of those units that was pushed off. Oh, you're talking about when they went in and, and, uh, and killed some of those Native Americans? Yeah, they murdered them. Uh, they were given orders, and unfortunately, in the military, an order is an order, and you fulfill it uh, to the best of your ability. And yeah, they were, they were there, they were involved. I don't know exactly what you're talking about. Um, the government made a decision. It went to the Philippine American War. By the way, there's the first about Philippine American War. <laughs> the United States government thought, well, we'll send these black guys over there to fight in the Philippines because it's hot, you know, it's really humid. Those guys are they're equipped for this stuff. They they don't have a problem with that. So the government sends them over to to fight and. And these black guys started getting the conscience, and they said, hey, wait a minute. This is another one of those uh, imperialistic uh, demands that this, this, this government is telling us to go kill these, these little uh, Filipinos. Uh, for what reason? We're not even sure what reason. So there were, there were actually some African Americans that, that left the military and, and went over to the Filipino side. Uh, but most of them. They did their duty. Their duty. They, they did what they were ordered to do. World War II. This, I, I don't want to forget this point. I know I'm going to get to be late. I don't want to be too late. Uh, in World War II, the African Americans had a model. And this is the same model that they've had from, from the beginning of time. They were fighting a double V. The double V was they wanted to have victory over fascism. They wanted to get rid of the fascist governments uh, in World War II. The second V was victory over racism. And so all along, every step of the way, you know, we're being told we're not good enough, we're not capable, we're not, we're not qualified. We want to end this racism, and that was a that was a command and a demand that they had from the very beginning. Uh, and so, when you talk about the Buffalo soldiers, you can't just do it in a in a small bubble. You've got to talk about all of the things, okay? And I just really glossed over a lot of this. So, uh, I think that if, again, if you if you go back in history and you look at it and you say. If the government had just made a decision not to make the African American three fifths of a human being and not gone through this, how much cooperation there would have been between the races? And there wouldn't be a race, you know? It'd be Americans, and that's what we all are. All right? so I'm giving you a to think about it. <laughs> uh, I hope that I hope that you find it valuable. Here's yes. one note to end on, perhaps. Okay. How do you think it looks today in the military, as far as that's concerned? Okay. So here, here's something. I believe that had I had an opportunity uh, to become an officer in the United States Army. And I had understood the struggles that some of those men went through before me. I think I would have treated the military a whole lot differently than I did. I left the military after seven years. I was a captain in the United States Army, military intelligence. I, I would have stayed because it, what is happening today is so important. When I look at people like Colin Powell, who was a lieutenant during Vietnam and comes to become the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, 
Uh, when I look at um, all of those men and all of their struggles, including my uncle's, my great uncle's struggles, if I had understood what they had to go through to become where we are today, I would have, I would have treated it so much more differently. Um, I think that where we're at today is so much better. I, I think that we are becoming in the military more of a colorblind military force. And I think people are judged based on their abilities and their talents rather than the color of their skin. And, and I guess my wish is that, that that could be translated across the rest of the nation and everybody would, would treat people the same. You know? Well, Dwight Austin, Secretary of Defense now. Yeah. Uh, there, there have been some real, real breakers. I mean, we've we've made some great progress, uh, but it shouldn't be because it shouldn't be a black thing or a white thing or or anything else. It's a, this guy is just totally qualified uh, to be to be the guy in charge. You know. Um, Congress that were fighting for people's rights and the military was lagging behind. And now with the military and the robot against the racism that's running rampant through the Congress. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And we've got to we've got to find a way as a nation to, to make those improvements. You know. Uh, I don't think I'll have that. How do you do it, Joe? So anyway, any other questions? Am I all right for time? Did I? Am I? Am I, am I hey, can I make a shady for it? Oh, about my uniforms. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> my uniforms. I, I am a part of the Buffalo Soldiers of the American West uh, organization. I have, I hold two ranks. I'm a corporal, uh, in which case, you know, I just kind of take orders and and then the other case is I'm one of the black officers from the uh, 1860s, 1870 time frame. And so I wear the rank of a captain in the United States Cavalry. How um, long did the Buffalo Soldiers exist? Or? Okay, that's a good question. 1866 is when they were formed. They were in existence until 1954. And I always love to say this. What was significant about 1954? And if you're 69, you know the answer. That was the year I was born. Okay, so uh, the Korean War. Uh, President Truman in um, 1948 made the decision. He said, I'm going to do an executive order. I'm going to eliminate the segregation in the military. And it took until 1954 before it was accomplished. Uh, so the guys that were in the 24th Infantry uh, Regiment, those were the last guys at Fort Machuca that ended up uh, the, the last segregated unit in the military. Thank you. Gosh, what, what happened to my presentation? Thank you all for coming. Next time, I hope it will be cooler. I'll be ready to. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>
You're not the only one. Yeah. I was just reading afterwards with the African Americans came back in World War II being treated worse than the Nazi prisoners. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I am. I'll do it. Yeah. Hey, oh, I'm hot. Oh, that's all right. I am too. <laughs> but we're sitting by the fan. It's one. Nice <laughs> car, right? Thank you. After Charles Young graduated in 1889, they don't allow another African American in West Point until Benjamin Oliver Davis Jr. starts in 1932. So almost 50 years between between the time that the government just said flat out, and when they don't have any black congressmen any longer, so there's nobody making nominations for black for blacks to come and be a part of the military, military academy. Uh, 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 I hope I'm not boring with you yet. Yeah? <laughs> well, not in Fort Collins. No, no, at Fort Collins. Oh, at Fort, oh yeah, oh yeah. As a matter of fact, I, I was I was there to kind of help, kind of guide that along. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, yeah. They invited me to come down and be a part of that. Yeah, and I, I had to tell him. I says, "Hey, you, you guys are. It's a nice story what you're telling." I said, "But, but you gotta remember these black black soldiers were not in that fort very often. They were they came in, they resupplied, and they, they were back out the gate again. They didn't they didn't get to spend a lot of time inside the gate." Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Thank I agree. You. You're pretty welcome. Where is that? Oh, oh. Uh, oh, I'm sorry that it got away too. You know, Ruth is gone. She kind of. It's okay. Well, I appreciate your, your. If you find anything else, if you find anything else, you let me know. Okay. I have uh, some photographs I keep forgetting to send you. Okay. I would be real happy with the knowledge of the I have I have quite a few of my stuff. Yeah, and, and actually in the library, uh, there is a there is a book on the fourth floor uh, that talks about the war. So each one of the wars in the 
the people that are dead and the front of them are so all in black and white. They're all in, they're all listed in the book, and there's just a couple of pages on each one of them. My dad's a way to find them. And if you don't want to do that, I'm starting to do this. Yeah, it's Oh, yeah. Do you want the chairs put away? Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> Too much work and it's hot in here. Do you still want to come volunteer? Yeah, I told Rose about you to in the contact you, but you may have to contact us. That's okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. What? No, indigenous. Um, the indigenous planning. I know that. I know that uh, I'm supposed to reload my, my wallet with my cards, and I never did. I am. I I told him that was an impossibility. I. Uh, I actually about cut my thumb off when I was a kid. Oh, and, uh, and my dad told me about that. He said, Ray, if you don't start using that thumb again, you're going to have to take a right hand. Oh. And I told my dad, there's no way, there's no way that that will ever happen. But I about severed that completely off. And, uh, yeah, I'd love to see it. I would love it, and especially if I can figure out names. So I did a I did a presentation on the black have you been up to the oh, oh, yeah. I just I didn't know but that was a black box. Yeah, I yeah. 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 Uh, I'm a screen yard should be the first time on the upper right in this blue or red button in the screen. Oh, here we go. In the broadcast. Turn off the video camera. Are we supposed to put everything away? No.